Welcome back. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk about some best practices for scientific computing with kind of taking a focus on, on the way we write code uh, to develop models and forecasts. So I, th I think one thing that most ecologists will admit is that ecologists write fairly crappy code. Uh, most of us do not come into this uh, with some with formal training. Uh, in computer science and software development. There, there's that's a pretty small number of, of folks who learned to code as part of their science that had that kind of formal training. Uh, furthermore, I've, I find that one of the challenges that ecologists have is that they uh, actually may, may not fully understand what good code looks like. So I've met folks who think this is what good code looks like because they assume that good code means code that is somehow demonstrating a, a very deep uh, understanding of, of you know, subtle nuances of, of deep aspects of, of computer languages uh, and, and very elegant, clever things. Uh, but I would argue that code like this that is, you know, has the, the positive of being highly optimized actually isn't good code. This code is not human readable. Uh, the variable names are meaningless. Uh, the code is undocumented as to what it's doing. Uh, and because of that, this sort of code is going to be hard to maintain. So any kind of efficiencies that are gained from you know, being you know, clever or uh, optimized or efficient are probably going to be lost in, in the time it takes, that it takes to set up the code and, and maintain the code. And that for most of the sorts of projects that ecologists work on, you spend far more time writing the code than the code ever spends running. So that ability to maintain code, you know, 90 plus percent of the time is the bottleneck uh, in, in all the work we do computationally. So here's a better example of what good code would look like. Uh, this is code that is written to be human readable. Uh, the variable names are self-documenting. You know, I don't need to say G equals 9.81 and then put a comment that says gravitational force you know, 100 lines later, you won't remember what G stands for. Um, this also is code that documents why something is done, not how it is done. So, you know, a comment in a code that says this is a for loop is not necessarily, uh, it, you know, insightful. It's like, if you look at the code, it's obvious that this is a loop. So don't, you don't need to tell someone you're going to loop over, you're going to set up a loop, but tell something why you're setting up a loop, uh, not how it's done. Always define constants for reuse to so avoid hard coding coefficients unless they cannot take on other values. Um, so even G was put as a const, uh, constant here so that you know you could reuse that time and time again. Yeah, so, uh, next kind of big picture problem that I think a lot of code has when it's written by ecologists is that we tend to write uh, we tend to write our code the way that we write uh, a quick email or a, a, a text or a, a tweet in that we kind of just start writing. Um, I think the, that one of the things that would make, it would improve a lot of our code is to start with a plan. So think of it more about, you know, you're writing how you would write a, an essay or a, a scientific paper. You start with a clear outline of what you want to say um, and, and the steps involved, you know, think about writing, you know, sketch, sketching on a board, boxes and arrows, defining, you know, uh, what the major modules are, uh, how they connect to each other, what their inputs and outputs are. And then convert that kind of chart, flow chart or outline into pseudocode. So pseudocode is not executable code. It's something that has the basic structure of code, uh, but it doesn't get into the details of implementation. So here is kind of what I would say is the pseudocode uh, behind how you know most Bayesian MCMC analyses work. And they, having done this hundreds of times, they, they all take on generally the same structure. And so I can say this is you know the structure of the analysis. And then when I go to implement it, it's a matter of for each of these chunks implementing what I actually did to do there. One of the advantages of starting with a plan and, and then writing down this pseudocode is the pseudocode essentially provides the documentation for code before you've written a single line of code. Uh, and is actually, you're much more likely to document the code this way than you are if you, 
you know, document code post hoc. And a key part of pl planning your code is to plan in terms of modules. So thinking about things in terms of fun functions or objects. Functions are critical. Uh, to good code. Functions isolate tasks. So what happens inside the function stays inside the function. It can't talk to anything outside of the function. Uh, it allows us to reuse code. So don't cut, never cut and paste code. If you're, if you're doing something multiple times, it probably means it should be encapsulated as a function. And once you encapsulate in the function, if you need to make any changes, you change it in one place. Uh, functions are also useful in separating uh, purpose from implementation. Purpose is usually defined in terms of inputs and outputs. The purpose of this module is to take these inputs in, you know, this vector, this file name, and give me back this output in terms of some concept. And then the modules def term define that purpose. As long as the inputs and outputs are set, you could change how it's implemented on the inside 100%, and it won't change how the rest of your system operates. So it, it really provides that isolation, modularity, and, and reuse. Um, the other key thing for good code is good documentation. And the best documentation is the documentation that's built into the code itself. Uh, a great example in R is the, are these tags from the Roxygen package, because these tags, this kind of metadata at name, at title, at export, at param, at author, can literally be co compiled by a bit of R code into the R help file. So, you know, rather than having a separate set of help files from the code, uh, the documentation stays with the code, which means that the, the documentation has a much better chance of staying up to date. Because when you change the code, you can change the documentation. When it when it's separate, that never happens. But undocumented code never gets reused. And and I think one of the key lessons I've taken in my career when it comes to both best practices on data and best practices on code is that you will, it's remarkable how quickly you will forget why you did something and the details of how you did something. And, and if for no one else, you document things because you will come back to them and need to remember what you did. Finally, you know, in all of the, these best practices, there, there are things to aspire to, but you know, ultimately, it is important to get our science done and we can't let uh, you know, the perfect be the enemy of, of the good. So what I wanna do next is to kind of highlight some of the key points that come out of this nice paper from Wilson et al on best practices for scientific computing, some of which reinforces things that I just said or said in some of the earlier lectures in this, this unit. Uh, so first kind of reinforcing what I said earlier, we write for White programs for people, not for computers. Things should be human readable. I like this first point that you should not require readers to hold more than a handful of facts in memory at once. Uh, so you should be able to read through it and not have to remember high level structure and not, definitely not have to remember what variable names mean or why you're doing things. It should be clear. Names should be consistent, distinctive, and meaningful. Code style should be consistent. It doesn't it doesn't matter which code style and formatting style you use, but you should be consistent. So, you know, indent a certain way and stick with it. Name variables a certain way and stick with it. You know, whether you like periods or underscores or capitalizations or whatever, it doesn't, that matters far less than not, than changing things up within a single bit of code. It makes it, you know, making variable names and function names and stuff like that predictable so that people know how to expect things to be named. Uh, and break down tasks into to small units. This comes back to the thing I was talking about with GitHub that you know you should commit code frequently and, and incrementally. So these increments could be a, you know in the order of an hour or so. And you you push a function, you push a change, you push an update, you commit it, and then you know you test it, verify that it works, and you move on. Automate repetitive tasks. This is things computers are good for. Um, use computers to record our history. Again, uh, these are soft, software tools can track workflows for us, um, make changes incrementally. Again, you know, as I've said so many times, and I'll continue to say throughout the semester when it comes to code, when it comes to data, when it comes to uh, statistics, start simple, add complexity incrementally, and then test 
when you add a new increment, test that it works. That way you know that if it doesn't work, that it was in the thing you just did. Um, you know, putting breaking things down into small modules, but then not testing any of them doesn't necessarily help you know where you broke things. Coming back again to our discussion on Git, you know, use version control. Um, adding to this, the, the idea that everything that's been created manually should be put into version control. The the flip of that, things that are generated automatically typically don't go into version control. So, you know, files that are outputs or intermediate steps that are machine generated definitely don't typically don't need to go under version control. Um, don't repeat yourselves or others. So reuse code. Uh, the idea of single authoritative representation, again, you, you know, define our constants to code, make code modular, uh, reuse code. Here's a good one, plan for mistakes. So uh, build tests into how you do things. Use the integration testing we talked about earlier uh, check, build in checks, so assertions to check their operation. So, you know, one thing that's common at a start of a function is our, our bits of code to make sure that the inputs that were put in were right. You know, if, if something can't be in, have an NA or a null or an infinity or whatever, check for that. If, if something's expecting numerical data, it should just stop if you give it text data. Uh, if something's expecting a file name and you give it a matrix, it should just stop. <laughs> and it, you know, you, you know, uh, kind of related to a general, another general principle that co code should stop where it fails. It shouldn't keep going and then fail further on because that's when it becomes really hard to debug. And you know, sometimes having code stop isn't wrong. You know, sometimes the best thing to do when, when something happens that is unexpected is to stop. Uh, optimize software only after it works correctly. That you know came back to that example of bad code at the beginning. Like, yeah, you, you don't want to prematurely optimize. You want things to work. You want it to be clear and transparent. And after things are clear and transparent, then you can worry about identifying computational bottlenecks. And there are computational tools like profilers that will identify where your code is spending most of the time and help you then say, okay, that's where I need to figure out why the code's taking longer than it should. Again, bringing us back to our, some of the things we've said about comments before, design, document the design and purpose of the code rather than mechanics. So reasons, not implementations. Uh, if, if you can't explain how a code works, uh, often you can, often refactoring, reorganizing the code in a different way to make it clear how it works is, can, is often preferable to long chunks of documentation. Um, and then embed the documentation in the software as much as possible. And then finally, it's important to conduct code reviews, particularly when you start working on code collaboratively. You know, code review and pair programming have been shown to be highly effective to catching bugs and in just also improving your coding skills. Uh, one thing that you know, we do in a lot of our projects is, is when someone has a pull request going into the repository and enforce it, someone else has to look at it and approve it and understand what was done before it becomes part of the main code. Uh, and then use issue tracking software. This is something that's built into GitHub and other systems. You know, If someone has an issue, if something doesn't work, open an issue. If you have a, things you're planning on doing in the future, open an issue. It allows you to keep track of uh, where there are problems in the code and then close comment, you know, close those when those, those problems have been solved. Um, last thing I wanted to say in this lecture chunk is, is the value of thinking about trying to make uh, our code open source when possible. Uh, so it should be, you know, free as in freedom that you shouldn't uh, be restricted. Uh, it's great when it's free in terms of no cost as well, but much more important open source means it's, it's open access, um, not un unnecessary restrictions on its use. And then importance of putting an actual license on your code, uh, just putting your code out publicly without a license actually puts it in an ambiguous legal state where uh, you know, it's not clear that others have a permission to reuse that. Um, so there's a lot of public open source licenses out there, a lot of options to choose from and, and don't reinvent licenses, something I said for data as well. Um, and then if you're going to get involved with larger open source projects or the development of community tools or models, you know, it's important to have, you know, an understanding of what the mechanisms 
and rules are for how you contribute to that code and how the projects evolve over time. Uh, this next set of figures comes from a nice paper from Hampton et al about open science and ecology. And in these figures, uh, which kind of represent a gradient of open science approaches, what's in gray are things that are kind of closed shop, they're, you know, might occur, you know, within your lab group. And uh, the things in white boxes are the things that are open to the broader community. So this is a, an example of how most many people start out thinking about open science, where I, you know, I give a poster or a talk and I post that pub poster or talk someplace publicly. I submit a paper and that pub paper obviously becomes public, but also I should be submitting the code. Uh, I should be archiving the data. And so this is kind of, I think, where we left off our discussion kind of last week about uh, reproducibility. Uh, but you can take this uh, to another level. You could think about you know, archiving the data sooner at the time that the, that the data is being collected, not at the time of publication, and then thinking about how you make uh, the analysis and writing of that more open. So you, you know, write your code uh, using this kind of iter iter uh, literate programming techniques uh, where the code and the, the the code compiles into the final paper itself, doing it in a public GitHub repository so that you have this more openness to input and openness to collaboration and just more transparency about what you're doing in terms of the analysis. Um, and then the, here is a kind of a more radically open version where you know the proposal proposed ideas are are open, uh, the draft proposal. And the design experiment is done open and open for input. Uh, the data is published as it's collected. The code is published as it's developed. Things are put in preprints, and and this is a the version that la you know leads to the most opportunities for collaboration and the most transparency. Uh, but it's it's a pretty radical departure from how most of us are doing science right now. So that kind of wraps up uh, the focus on uh, data management, uh, sorry, on code management and scientific workflows specifically. I'm gonna, uh, as part of this unit, I'm gonna tack on one extra little bit uh, that's gonna set us up for next week's discussion on Bayesian statistics and model data integration. So I'm gonna give another qu quick lecture, laying the foundations for, for likelihoods. Thanks. <laughs>